We have access to more scientific evidence for nutrition and health claims than ever before. Yet the public remains quite confused. And that's not a mistake, it's by design. Confusion and fear and other marketing tactics are what sell books and products. It's what makes people famous even. But if we were to become better consumers of information, it wouldn't be so hard to get the answers we need to do better and improve our lives. But until we get our act together, people in the diet business will continue having their way with us. And at some point, that says more about us than about them. A recent example of this is Dr. Gundry and his book The Plant Paradox. Now here is a book that really belongs in the fiction section of your local bookstore. To be kind, it's a load of oversimplified, highly exaggerated, manipulated info with little to no scientific basis. Yet, it's making the bestsellers list. People buy this book. They share his recommendations with their friends and loved ones. They even buy his products. Why is he so successful in convincing the general public to follow his dietary advice? Now, I have to admit, there's no denying it, Dr. Gundry is very popular right now. He's having his 15 minutes. But in a month, or perhaps a year, maybe two years, there will be another doctor with another popular book rehashing some other grossly negligent material. But instead of spending time responding to every dangerous fad, what if we educated and empowered the public empowered you to be able to better separate fact from fiction and not to be blinded by credentials or charisma or by whatever makes the headlines or the best-selling list of the month. You see, I'm using Dr. Gundry's recent publications just as an example of material that confuses and harms the public. But the real purpose of this video is to help you gain much more confidence in your ability to separate proper health information from marketing disguised as science. Knowing the difference can literally save your life. All right, let's begin with nine steps to manipulating public opinion about nutrition. So how do we do this? How, how do we all become Dr. Gundry's? How do we take information that has no evidence and sell it to the people who then believe us and pay us for more services and products and whatnot? How does he do it? Well, you're going to find out. Number one, very simple, boost up your credentials. Boost them up. Let everybody focus on how great you are. This is so that people let their guards down, and so they are less likely to question you. And that's so important because it makes up for the fact that your current theories, what you're currently trying to sell, cannot stand on its own. One of Gundry's infomercials posted on his website refers to him as a world-famous surgeon whose achievements include the longest surviving pig to baboon heart transplant. That's really incredible. But what does it have to do with dietary advice? Nothing. But people trust doctors. Even when a doctor is speaking beyond the limitations of his expertise. So, just put MD on your diet book and you're gold. Step number two, shock and awe. Make a shocking claim. Say you've discovered a secret to health that nobody else knows. Not your peers, not the medical establishment, not scientists, no one. You've landed on the moon all by yourself. Of course, you'd be the one to discover this incredible secret because you have those great credentials you just told us about. So what's Dr. Gundry's incredible discovery? Well, just look at the cover of his book. There's a tomato on it, a crushed tomato. And according to him, tomatoes and other so-called healthy plant-based foods are the reason we're all getting sick. That's right, we're eating too many tomatoes. That's the problem. It sounds so crazy that there has to be 
some explanation. He's got to know something. I mean, he's a world-class surgeon. He's got to have some evidence, right? Which brings us to step number three. Sight studies. Let people believe that your shocking secret to health is supported by lots of scientific evidence and list references all throughout your book and your website, even when the studies you refer to say the exact opposite of what you're claiming. Don't worry, most people won't even check your sources, because if they did, you'd be in trouble. Can you guess what I'm about to do right now? Yeah, you got it. I'm going to check his sources. So first up, early in, in the book, on page number four, Dr. Gundry makes the following shocking claim. Eating shellfish and egg yolks dramatically reduces total cholesterol. That goes against every other study published on this topic. But you see, Dr. Gundry put a citation. That number one you see there. So that gives you the chance to look up the study that he's referencing. So I looked it up. And in this study, they saw a drop in cholesterol in people who removed meat, cheese, and egg yolks. They removed egg yolks and saw a drop in cholesterol. That's the evidence that Dr. Gundry uses to show that egg yolks dramatically reduce cholesterol? That's a serious issue. It's a complete misrepresentation of the results. And it confuses people. Because one day they're told to just eat egg whites. Next day, a new popular diet from a world-renowned doctor is instructing them to do the exact opposite. But it's not confusing. It's not confusing at all. It's actually quite simple. Dr. Gundry made a nutrition claim and he cited a study to support his claim. I looked up the study and by doing so discovered that he wasn't telling the truth. The only reason you would still be confused right now as a consumer is because of step number one. Boost up your credentials to make up for the fact that your claims are not supported by the scientific evidence. Shame on you, Dr. Gundry. And as you go through Dr. Gundry's book or his website, there are many instances where he makes these incredible claims completely unsubstantiated by any of the scientific evidence. And he puts citations and you look up the studies he's talking about and time after time you see that it's the opposite of what he's trying to lead you to believe. I don't know why he would do that. Is he purposely leading you in the wrong direction? And he kind of knows that you're not going to check his references. You're not going to go look up the studies. Or he's just not very good at looking at information. Whichever it is, it doesn't matter. Point is, it's harmful to you. It's harmful to anybody who believes him. And it's time we stepped up our game and became better consumers and not so gullible. Now, we'll talk about more studies a little later on, but I want to keep things going. Let's go to step number four in how to manipulate the public into believing your fantastic nutrition claims. So number four is the old adage, keep it simple, stupid. Make it all seem very simple. Ideally, sum up the cause of everybody's health problems with just one word. That's the best way to sell to a public with a limited attention span. Don't use two words, you may lose some people. Just one word will do. Fat. Carbs. Sugar. Salt. Gluten. Or, in Dr. Gundry's case, the word is lectins. That's why people get sick. Lectins. That's the number one message of his book. Lectins. They're out there, and they're coming to get you. And you need to remove them from your diet. But there's one problem. Virtually all foods have lectins in them. 
lectins are in tomatoes, of course. That's why the cover of Dr. Gundry's book features a tomato. But they are also in a lot of other healthy foods. They're in vegetables, fruits, seeds, nuts, um, beans, peas, lentils, and whole grains. And so according to Dr. Gundry, we made a huge mistake by focusing on the word gluten. Gluten is just one type of lectin, but apparently there are many different types of lectins in healthy food, even in gluten-free foods. So you see, the word gluten is out. It's so last year. And lectin is the new buzzword to capture the public's imagination. Just eliminate your consumption of lectins and all of your health issues will disappear. That stubborn weight you couldn't lose, gone. Cancer, gone. Autoimmune disease, gone. Heart disease, gone. A whole list of health conditions, gone, if you just eliminated this one thing from your diet. It's easy to remember. It's just one word. It's all you have to do. But there's a big problem with Dr. Gundry's hypothesis. We have at least a hundred years of scientific research I'm talking about study after study published in peer-reviewed medical journals showing why people who consume the most lectin-rich foods, such as legumes and grains, are the healthiest people on the planet. Just look at the Blue Zones. When researchers traveled the world to find the healthiest communities, they discovered five places where people live to 100 more than anywhere else on the planet and without the high rates of disease that affects their neighbors. These areas of superior health and longevity became known as the Blue Zones. And it comes as no surprise that all of these communities consume a 95 to 100% plant-based diet with whole grains and beans forming the cornerstone of their diets. People in Blue Zones eat a cup of beans a day. That's a lot of lectins. So what could possibly be so wrong about lectins? Well, first, I want to ask you, the consumer of health information, to stop looking for one-word answers. There is a term for that in science. It's called reductionism. Scientific reductionism is a tool that can be used against you to sell you ideas and books and products that are either not helpful or can be potentially very harmful to you. So it would be in your interest to know how to recognize reductionism when you see it. So let's take a, a minute to focus on this topic because I'm completely convinced from working with many people day in and day out who are more or less confused about nutrition, that if we were to truly explain this well, this concept of scientific reductionism, you would understand perhaps the biggest misconception about nutritional science, and this would greatly benefit your decision making about your health and your dietary approach. So scientific reductionism is when you try to understand or study very complex things by looking at individual parts taken out of context. This approach assumes that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts, much like 1 plus 1 equals 2. But nutrition and metabolism don't work that way. With every bite of food you consume, there are thousands upon thousands of things working together, countless interactions that create outcomes. It's not as simple as one plus one equals two. The pharmaceutical industry is based on this reductionist approach of looking at and treating one thing at a time, making people believe that all they need to prevent osteoporosis are bone medications and calcium supplements. And all they need to prevent heart attacks are blood pressure and cholesterol medications. But the bigger picture has shown us that it's not as simple as that. And this approach has just not resulted in people feeling healthier or living better lives. It's failed miserably. But what the reductionist paradigm is very good at is making money. Because it offers us simple, one word, 
magic bullet solutions to our deepest problems. And that's why the public eats it up all the time. And it's also why the public is so confused about nutrition. Now, let me use somewhat of a funny but clear example to illustrate this point. I use the word funny, but it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a disaster, as you'll see. There is something you can consume. I'm not going to reveal what that something is just yet. But what I will tell you is that it can have the same levels of antioxidant properties as fruits and vegetables. And we all know that antioxidants are the key to good health. So does this automatically make this substance healthy to consume? The answer is no, because I'm talking about tobacco, the antioxidant properties of tobacco. Now, of course, this won't confuse you, because by now the age of tobacco science manipulation has come to an end. And you know, without a doubt, that tobacco products are harmful. So no amount of reductionist science is going to convince you otherwise. Because you've seen the big picture. When you consume tobacco, you aren't just consuming antioxidants, you're consuming the whole tobacco. And no matter how much someone can study the beneficial effects of isolated chemicals that exist within tobacco, they won't be able to shake you. They won't be able to use that reductionist study to convince you to smoke. You don't get confused when you see a study about beneficial nutrients in tobacco. <laughs> I mean, you don't throw your arms up in the air and say things like, oh my goodness, one week they tell us cigarettes are bad for us, and the next week they tell us it's good to smoke. I don't know what to do anymore. No, you don't have that confusion about tobacco. But maybe... There are other topics that you are in fact confused about. I see people every day who are confused about things like coconut oil, dark chocolate, red wine. And that confusion exists because of exaggerated and manipulated interpretations of reductionist studies. And I've got some news for you. We have accumulated 10 decades worth of clear scientific evidence about the effects of food on our health. Good science, and lots of it. And the results have been consistent. You see, there is nothing wrong with reductionist studies. They have been so crucial for advancing our understanding of things. But it's when the results are taken out of context that we are so easily manipulated. That's why it took us 50 years to force the tobacco industry to come clean that industry actually created public distrust about science. It was their marketing strategy to have the public lose trust in facts, to have doubt about scientific evidence. And that's the same strategy utilized today. It's the same strategy behind the marketing of Dr. Gundry's book, The Plant Paradox. So to sum up this section about keeping things simple, using one-word answers to explain complicated issues, lectins in beans and grains do not make consuming beans and grains unhealthy. In fact, the bulk of the scientific evidence shows otherwise, the same way that antioxidants in tobacco products do not make tobacco products healthy to consume, the bulk of the scientific evidence, many different types of studies, different methodologies, all coming together over many decades, shows this to be true. Now, I would love to give lots of detailed explanations about the confusion that exists around coconut oil and, and red wine and, and all these other topics that seem to contradict uh, the headlines from one week to the next. Uh, one week they're good, next week they're bad, when in reality the evidence has been clear on these topics for many, many years. Uh, I'd love to do this because it would really highlight how the only reason we're confused is not due to the actual science, but due to the misrepresentation and exaggeration of reductionist studies, which 
can't stand on their own as evidence to base any claims on. But I've got to move on, okay? So I'm going to reserve that opportunity for another time, including a little later in this lecture, when I'll be coming back to discussing some of these foods. Now we've got to move on to step number five of how to confuse the public about nutrition. Are you still with me? Good, let's move on. Step number five is something that politicians do very effectively to fool people. It's about using logical fallacies along with simple imagery to get people to nod in agreement with you even though the reasoning and imagery you're using has little to do with the topic actually being discussed. So, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, a logical fallacy is an error in reasoning that renders an argument invalid. But, it allows you to make a false claim that seems correct because it is based on some facts and that's why it makes it easier for the public to believe you. Now here's an example of a logical fallacy between politicians. On the left, the politician says that she's against going to war. And her opponent responds with, since you're against going to war, you must be against our troops. And now you can easily see how that's an error in logic, it, it, it's a clear fallacy, because somebody could be against a specific war while still be in complete support of the troops. There's more choices. It's not just black or white. Uh, this type of logical fallacy is called a false dilemma or a black or white fallacy. And there are many other types of fallacies that politicians um, often use, as well as people who are uh, attempting to contort the information to support their arguments. It's just another very effective way of deflecting people's attention away from the facts, or, in Dr. Gundry's case, lack of facts. Let me give you three examples where Dr. Gundry effectively uses logical fallacies with imagery to convince his followers. First, he explains how plants don't want to be eaten. He knows what they want and they don't want to be eaten. Here's what he says, and I'll quote, As it turns out, even health foods like fruits and vegetables can actually do your body harm. Why? Plants don't want to be eaten. They simply want to survive. One of the ways they defend themselves against hungry animals like us is by producing toxic chemical compounds, proteins known as lectins. End of quote. And let me just quote Dr. Gundry one more time. He says, let's set the record straight. Plants don't like us. They were here first. They had it great before animals arrived because nobody wanted to eat them or their babies, their seeds. When animals arrived, plants had a problem. They couldn't run, they couldn't hide, and they couldn't fight. But they were chemists of incredible ability. So they turned to chemical warfare to convince their new predators, animals, not to eat them. End of quote. And you know what? Dr. Gundry makes a lot of sense. He's right. Nature always finds a way to survive. But look at the language and imagery he's using. Plants don't want to be eaten. That's a powerful statement because we can relate to the concept of not wanting to be eaten. We begin to feel sympathetic towards plants. How dare we eat them or their babies? And it's true. Even though plants don't have a central nervous system, they do have the ability to protect themselves. Some plants have thorns. And by the way, roses, contrary to popular belief, don't have thorns. They have what we call prickles which are like razor-sharp freckles. And it gets more interesting. Some plants are even able to communicate with other plants through chemical signaling to warn them of impending danger, such as drought or microbial infection. And they do this, believe it or not, by releasing VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Nature is incredible. 
plants, as we all know, can even be poisonous. But not poisonous to all species. For example, birds are not affected by the toxic oil produced by poison ivy. Okay, wait a moment. Hold on. What does any of this have to do about our health and nutritional habits? I was so interested by Dr. Gundry's advocacy for the desires and needs of plants and their babies that I lost track of the fact that we are supposed to be discussing evidence, the scientific evidence behind his health claims that consuming grains and legumes are harmful to us. Is there any strong evidence behind the imagery? Anything at the end of this yellow brick road? No. But while we're on the topic of plants not wanting to be eaten, we should also mention that these creatures who do have a central nervous system also don't want to be eaten. That's the power of imagery. And vegans use such imagery to convince the public to stop consuming animal products. But if you leave veganism out of it, Remove compassion and ethics from your decision-making. The preponderance of the scientific evidence clearly indicates that eating animals destroys our health. We don't need to tell stories when we have facts. We can just look at the science with honesty, integrity, and transparency. Now, on to another one of Dr. Gundry's logical fallacies. He does interviews on TV shows and podcasts, and he says things like this. Five raw kidney beans will kill you in five minutes. And of course, that's because of the lectins. And you know what? Dr. Gundry is right again. The best manipulations occur when someone begins with a little bit of truth. Raw kidney beans do cause food poisoning symptoms. But raw kidney beans are like little rocks. Nobody eats raw kidney beans on purpose. It's almost like saying cinnamon powder is bad for you because you can die from ingesting just one spoonful of dry cinnamon. But we don't dip a spoon into a bag of cinnamon powder and swallow it. We add it to food, which makes everything okay. And we don't eat raw kidney beans, Dr. Gundry. At least not on purpose. Enough. Now is a good opportunity to put an end to this lectin nonsense and to add some helpful recommendations on how to make legumes, grains, nuts, and seeds even healthier to consume. Our ancestors didn't have the internet. They didn't have all the information we have today. But they had something called intuition. And using their intuition, they understood that soaking and sprouting seeds made them much more nutritious and easier to digest. Even kidney beans, which have some of the highest levels of so-called anti-nutrients, have negligible amounts of lectins left over after being soaked and sprouted. If Dr. Gundry was capable of a nuanced conversation, leaving all the shock and awe aside for a minute, I would explain how in my practice I teach all my clients to always soak and sprout grains and legumes before consuming them. And sprouting does a lot more than just remove lectins and phytic acid and breaking down gluten, but it also improves the entire nutritional profile of the seed in ways that make sprouts and microgreens the most complete and nutritious foods available to us. So in short, if you are worried about lectins, simply cooking beans will get rid of them. And if you want to do what is best for many reasons, soaking and sprouting them the way your grandparents used to do is the ideal way to go. It's an ancient tradition that we should have never left behind. Now, I'm going to end this section on logical fallacies with the one that really made my jaw drop to the floor when I heard it. I couldn't believe it. And it wasn't anything to do with the conclusion that Dr. Gundry was making, but with his reasoning for it. It was so blatantly false, 
and to give him the benefit of the doubt, at best, I felt that he was insulting the public's intelligence. But I'll be blunt. I was troubled by it. And disgusted, really. So let me break it down for you. And hopefully this exercise will be helpful to you as you consider the validity of other recommendations you come across in the future. So Dr. Gundry makes the shocking claim that wheatgrass is toxic. And this claim sounds very much like a marketing stunt, consistent with his other attempts to shock the public without any evidence. Or, as I've shown earlier, by misrepresenting the evidence. He uses one article to support his claim that wheatgrass is toxic, and when you find it, you discover that it says the exact opposite. No adverse events of wheatgrass have been reported, and that wheatgrass has shown to have many benefits, including anti-cancer potential, and so on. So again, there's nothing new here. It's just another claim Dr. Gundry makes citing research that indeed says the opposite. And that's not the part that made my jaw drop. It's the next line of evidence he uses that made me realize he's taking advantage of the public in the worst of ways. He uses dogs eating grass and vomiting as evidence that it's bad for us. Let me quote him directly. Ever notice that when a dog wants to throw up, it eats grass? Yup. Dogs aren't supposed to eat grass either. End of quote. Okay, let's dissect this claim. Now pay attention. Let's show you how even a famous doctor can have serious gaps with his logic. First of all, people do not consume the whole grass. We juice it and consume wheatgrass juice. And that's something we've done for over six decades. And at my practice, I've seen clients with serious digestive issues, such as colitis, reverse their disease, eliminating all symptoms while consuming wheatgrass juice on a daily basis. So why is Dr. Gundry comparing drinking wheatgrass juice to eating grass? That's a faulty comparison. Second, what grass does a dog eat? The grass outside on your lawn? With all the pesticides and insecticides and parasites from the feces of other animals? Dr. Gundry, that's a second faulty comparison because people don't eat their lawn. Third, is wheatgrass actually bad for dogs? No, studies show otherwise. Plant eating is indeed normal dog and cat behavior, not associated with illness. Most dogs don't even vomit after grazing. And you can find many resources where vets and other pet specialists actually recommend feeding wheatgrass to your dogs, as I have done with my dog for many years. So, if the quality of Dr. Gundry's reasoning boils down to dogs eating grass, I think we're going to have to wait a long time before he contributes anything of value to the field of nutritional science. A very long time. But in the meantime, the take-home lesson here is that even doctors, including successful surgeons like Dr. Gundry, can be completely wrong about every aspect of nutritional claims they make. And sometimes, you can be fooled by certain intellectual tricks, such as the use of faulty comparisons, that can be used to overshadow logic. And sometimes people say things not because they necessarily mean them or are convinced, but because they need to shock the public for marketing purposes to build their brand, which is step number six of how to manipulate the public. Build your brand. For example, the brand of the doctor who makes shocking discoveries. Speaking of brands, I want to mention something about an Anthony Robbins seminar. Now, we all know Anthony Robbins as a great speaker and life coach who teaches people, including business people, CEOs of huge companies, and even politicians, how to achieve even greater success. 
He reminds business people of the importance of marketing and branding. If you don't market your brand successfully, people won't know about you. They won't read your books, they won't come to your seminars, they won't buy your products, and so you won't be able to help them. And that's fine. I mean, that's great advice for business, but not for nutritional science. I think marketing and branding is the problem, not the solution. Now, why am I talking about Tony Robbins? Here is why. He's associated with Dr. Gundry. He endorses Dr. Gundry's latest book, The Plant Paradox, and Dr. Gundry was a speaker at Tony Robbins' Unleash the Power Within program. Here's where it gets interesting for people who attended the seminar. First, they are shown a video of Tony Robbins talking about the importance of eating lots of living foods, meaning wheatgrass, plants, etc., and how we must restrict acidic foods like animal protein and coffee, as well as avoid dairy and saturated fats. That's fine. Anthony Robbins has been encouraging people to eat more living foods for a long time now. And he even sells wheatgrass products on his website and has done so for many years. But the next speaker at his seminar is Dr. Gundry, author of The Plant Paradox, the guy who says wheatgrass is toxic and plants are toxic. And after Dr. Gundry finishes, there are other speakers, such as the founder of the Bulletproof brand, including Bulletproof Coffee, which is coffee mixed with butter and oil. Can you imagine being in attendance at this event? The first guy sells wheatgrass and discourages consumption of coffee and saturated fat. The next guy says wheatgrass is toxic and plants want to kill us. And the third guy says that the secret to health is coffee mixed with butter and oil. <laughs> All highly successful brands. Now, I came across a blog the other day, a health blog written by someone who attended this event, the Unleash the Power Within four-day event with Tony Robbins. And she was trying to reconcile the contradictions she had heard from all these speakers so that her readers could know how to make sense of it all. And I can't help but think that this is really a case of the blind leading the blind leading the blind. And all it does is add confusion. So now you have two subsets of confused people. The first includes those who think they know so much about nutrition because they attend popular seminars and read best-selling books, keeping up to date with the latest info, so they think. And the second group consists of people who say, ah, screw it, nobody knows anything. And it's normal for them to feel frustrated and confused they don't know who to listen to anymore, with all the health bloggers and diet doctors always contradicting each other, even at the same event sometimes. It's ridiculous. And so it makes people want to just stop caring about food and give up. And that's when programs like Weight Watchers come right in. And people think to themselves, wait a second, I don't need to know anything? I just have to count points? That's it? This is wonderful. But it's not wonderful. It's an obsessive and reductionist approach of just counting points, counting calories, thinking that health and nutrition is just a mathematics equation like 1 plus 1 equals 2. This completely ignores the complexity of the human body. It ignores all the science. And it's not only ineffective in the long run, but it can also be harmful. And the funny thing is, when people lose weight on Weight Watchers, they are quick to say how well it worked for them. But then when they gain the weight back, they blame themselves. And that's what makes the business so successful, because they enroll again. And this yo-yo type experience is anything but healthy. So why? Why do intelligent people fall for these diets and programs? Why do smart people put their intuition aside when it comes to falling for these gimmicks? The answer is good branding. People are followers. If everybody else is doing it, it must be okay. If a doctor with a best-selling book says something, it must be correct. And we all know how branding works. We know this. We know that sometimes we pay more for the exact same product made by the same people in the same factory. 
and it may not even be a good product, but it's a well-known brand, so we give it a try. But here, we're not talking about investing in products. We're talking about your health and ultimately your life. And when it comes to health decisions, it's not a time to allow branding to influence you. It's not a time to look at what's popular. And that's why I say that branding can be dangerous in the health industry, specifically more so when people with medical credentials do it, because it fools the public into thinking it's science when it's really just business as usual. Okay, so that was step number six of how to manipulate people, which describe the power and influence of branding. Now, before we move on to step number seven, I just want to take a moment to jump back to step number five. If you recall, it was all about using logical fallacies, these intellectual sleight of hands, intellectual tricks to fool you. Uh, in politics, they use what we call the straw man argument, which is when they misrepresent or exaggerate an opponent's point of view in order to make it easier to attack or to make themselves look better. So these type of tricks, they confuse you, they can get to you. But there are other ways, deeper ways to influence and confuse you. More emotional ways, you could say, and, and you know, less intellectual. And it's important to know what they are so that you can improve your self-awareness. So this brings us to step number seven, which is about using people's addictions against them. It's about telling them what they want to hear. Simply put, step number seven is say good things about people's addictions. Say good things about their bad habits. They love to hear it. And this makes complete sense. I mean, think about it. If there's something you've enjoyed eating for a long time and you do it all the time, you do it every day, you don't want to hear that it's bad for you. You don't want that information. You want to hear good things about it. You gravitate towards that good news about your bad habits. I mean, how could something that feels so good be so wrong? So you turn on your TV, you open your magazine, and you see the headlines touting the benefits of red wine, dark chocolate, olive oil, coconut oil, coffee. And you do a little happy dance, don't you? I mean, my goodness, you knew these foods were good for you. You just knew it. And now, according to the latest news, scientists have confirmed what you already felt deep inside of you. These are the foods that will make you healthy. A little later, I'll explain in some detail how the headlines claiming the scientific benefits of these foods are often just negligent misinterpretations or gross exaggerations to promote the sales of products. But the reason it's so easy to fool people is because they want to be fooled. Let's imagine something. Let's imagine that you're talking to your friend Bob. Uh, and you're talking to Bob about the Blue Zones, where people live long and healthy. And so you say, Bob, in the Blue Zones, people are very active. They move around and lift and carry and work with their bodies well into their 90s. And Bob looks at you funny and says, exercise? Physical activity? Nah. Sounds like work. What else do they do in the Blue Zones? Well, Bob... They eat a 95 to 100% plant-based diet centered around grains and legumes, fresh vegetables, herbs, and so on. And now Bob is beginning to get frustrated. That's not what I want to do. I can't give up meat, Bob says. What else do they do in the blue zones? Well, Bob, exercise and a plant-based diet, um, I mean, those are the things most studied over the past 10 decades that we know for sure scientifically are most associated with longevity. I mean, if you want something else they do in the blue zones, uh, sure, I mean, they have a little bit of oil. What? Hold on, says Bob. They consume oil? I consume oil too. That must be why they are so healthy. It's all making sense to me now. I just saw a study the other day about the benefits of oil. No, Bob, they're healthy despite their consumption of oil. 
Oh, I'm not sure you're right about that. And what about alcohol? What about wine? It was all over TV last week that scientists have discovered that alcohol is more effective than exercise for living long. Do they drink alcohol in the blue zones? Yes, Bob. They have a bit of red wine. And that's how you lose Bob. That's how Bob never makes a change in his life. Because what he wants to believe is being confirmed by the news headlines and apparently by studies. And now even by popular doctors like Dr. Gundry, who has step number seven down to perfection. Tell people that some of the foods they are already craving are good for them. While the foods that parents have been trying to get their children to eat forever, such as beans and lentils, are bad for them. That's an easy message to market, isn't it? Dr. Gundry even says things like the point of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. Who wouldn't want to lean in and pay attention? All this time you've been cutting back on the fatty salad dressing when you should have been adding more, more fat, more oil, more dressing, please. Dr. Gundry says it's what I need to do. And if that wasn't enough, in the morning, Dr. Gundry recommends a cappuccino coffee with oil and butter mixed in. And so if you want to continue believing that Dr. Gundry's recommendations are good for you, I suggest you don't check his sources. Don't look up, don't read the studies he's referencing to support his position. Because the less you know, the easier it'll be for you to keep believing what you want to believe in. Now, the amount of industry-sponsored reductionist junk science and advertising surrounding some of these foods is worrisome. In a little bit, I will explain at least one way that the results of such studies are manipulated. But for now, the take-home message is simply this. If you care, truly care about your health, don't just gravitate to what you want to hear about certain foods, to what you hope is true. This leaves you vulnerable to misinformation. It puts your guard down, making it easier to convince you of things which aren't always as true as they seem. And in the end, this makes it harder for you to change bad habits for good ones. Now let's move on to step number eight in this scheme of manipulating the public. And step number eight is sell products. What many people may not know is that most books don't generate much of a profit for the offer, but they are written so that the offer can become recognized as an expert in his field, so that he can make money in other ways, such as through selling services or products. Perhaps Dr. Gundry's oversimplified and out-of-context views about lectins have something to do with his product line. Now, I'm not saying you can't build a business around the recommendations you believe in. In fact, that's the best way to live your passion. But when you are consistently misrepresenting the evidence in a way that leads people back to your product line, it becomes more difficult to give you the benefit of the doubt. And especially more so when you are a surgeon and researcher who should know better than to write such flimsy material. Now, this happens with scientific studies as well, where an industry knows beforehand the result it wants to show. And so it hires scientists to design a study that would lead to such a result. In other words, they begin with the answer and work backwards. That's not how science should be done. Real, ethical science is when you begin with a question and you let the evidence lead you forward, even when the results may not suit your self-interests. And contrary to popular belief, it's not hard for anyone to read a study and recognize bias in it. You see it clearly in the design of the study. For example, if they want to show that something bad is good for you, they compare it to something terrible. If you want to show 
that adding more olive oil to your diet improves your cholesterol levels, you do a study comparing people who consume olive oil with people who consume butter. Because increasing your consumption of olive oil has only shown to be possibly beneficial when it replaces saturated fats such as butter. You want to show that eating lots of cheese lowers cholesterol? You compare it to eating equal amounts of butter. Why is everybody always picking on butter? Of course, this headline would read, Cheese intake in large amounts lowers cholesterol. Study finds. And people would get confused and they'd raise their arms up and go, Oh my goodness, what the heck? Last month cheese was bad, now it's good. No, nothing's changed. Just go read the study. See who funded it. See what the scientific process was. And make sense of it for yourself. So, step number eight, again, is about selling your product. Because why else would you go through all the trouble of confusing the public if it wasn't for some kind of financial gain? And all the big industries use science to market their products. From the meat industry to the dairy industry, the supplement industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the olive oil and wine industries, the strategy is the same. It's to blur the lines between science and marketing, to make their health claims appear to be evidence-based, to take advantage of the fact that everyday people are too preoccupied to find and read the actual studies. So they just rely on headlines. Headlines that are written by lazy journalists who don't ask follow-up questions regarding the studies and the designs of these studies and the results. They just love to create these attention-grabbing headlines that appeal to the public's addictions. It's a well-oiled machine, and profit is all that matters in the end. All right, let's move on to the final step. Step number nine of how to manipulate people is use anecdotal evidence, your personal story, to make up for the fact that your claims are not supported by science. Now, I'm not saying that studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals is the only evidence that matters. But what I am saying is that when it comes to personal anecdotes, you have to apply some logic and common sense. Let me give you an example that many of you are familiar with. It happens often at, at the dinner table, when at some point the conversation turns to health, and then someone, like good old Uncle Bob, says, I used to suffer terribly from headaches and stomach aches every morning. And then one day, I was at the market, and there was this guy in a booth giving out health advice for free. And so I told him about my problems. And he sold me a special tea. And he instructed me to take this tea every morning, promising that all of my pain would go away. And so the very next morning, I did exactly what he said. I took the tea, and it was the first time in months that I got to work without any pain. And I've been drinking this tea ever since, and my head and stomach don't hurt like they once did. And of course, at this point of the conversation, everybody around the table is intrigued about this special tea. Bob, can you buy me some the next time you go? Because I think it can really help my friend. Sure, says Uncle Bob. If it helped me, it can help him. And this is the point where I have to make a decision. There I am sitting on the side listening to this. Do I say something or do I let this one go? And I don't often like to let these things go because I don't think it's kind to do so. So I jump in and I say, Bob, what were you doing before you began drinking this tea? Were you eating or drinking something else? Yes, says Bob. I would go down to this breakfast place and have four eggs two slices of bacon, some toast and jam. Anything else, Bob? Yes. Sometimes I would have a small pancake with some maple syrup. I used to love maple syrup. Now, Bob, did you continue having this breakfast when you started on that tea thing? Oh, no, says Uncle Bob. The guy told me to just have the tea and to wait at least two hours before eating, so I couldn't go down to the breakfast place anymore. And slowly, as the conversation moves on, Bob begins to understand that 
Maybe his pain was due to the eggs and bacon and pancake and maple syrup that he was consuming every morning that he had stopped consuming. Coincidentally, as he got better. Now, I have to note that I'm not dismissing Bob's experience. I do believe he was in pain, changed something, and got better. I'm just not relying on his interpretation of what happened to form conclusions. And what I want you to understand is that many of these nutrition books, diet books, weight loss books written by doctors rely heavily on the same type of anecdotal evidence that Uncle Bob uses. But because the message comes from a doctor, it somehow seems more scientific. For example, Dr. Gundry says things like this. Vegans are some of the unhealthiest people that I have met. He also shares his personal anecdote about when he was eating a vegan diet and weighed over 230 pounds at 5 foot 10, even though he was running 30 miles a week and going to the gym for an hour every day. And he was in a lot of pain, he says. And of course, it was when he discovered the dangers of lectins and stopped consuming grains and beans that he healed his body, lost the weight, and felt better. Okay. First thing to look at is the word vegan. Any researcher knows that veganism is a lifestyle, not a specific diet. Of course, you can be unhealthy even if you are vegan. After all, potato chips are vegan. So is candy, chocolate, even Coca-Cola is vegan, French fries are vegan, and so on. So you have to wonder, if Dr. Gundry was feeling bad on a vegan diet, was he eating the same foods that these women eat? As many of you know, these are the famous Williams sisters, Venus and Serena Williams, arguably the best female tennis players we've ever seen. And when Venus was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and her career looked like it was over, she did her homework and with her sister's support, went on a vegan diet with lots of wheatgrass juice, grains and beans. You know, all the foods that Dr. Gundry say made him weak and overweight. But these are the foods that Venus credits for allowing her to reverse the symptoms of her autoimmune disease and return to tennis as a winner. Now I know what you're thinking. Whose story do you trust? Who has the better anecdote? The good Dr. Gundry or the star tennis player Venus Williams? It looks like we need a tiebreaker. Does anybody know what Beyonce is eating this week? I'm just teasing. Of course, we have to look at the scientific evidence as a whole to form our conclusions. And the truth is that as a researcher in the medical field, Dr. Gundry should know better than to rely heavily on anecdotal evidence and perhaps speak with some more restraint. But he, along with many other doctors who have written popular books on diet and health, often stretch the evidence they have for their claims far beyond its limitations similar to what Uncle Bob does at the dinner party. Uncle Bob? Uncle Gundry? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know, all kidding aside, I'm happy, as a fan of tennis, that the Williams sisters looked at the evidence and made the right decisions to improve their health. As I am deeply proud of my clients who have achieved incredible success by following the evidence-based approach that I teach, and getting off recommendations made by Dr. Gundry and other popular figures in the media. Okay, so this concludes the nine steps to manipulating public opinion about nutrition. Let's do a very quick review before I make my closing remarks. All right, so here goes. Step number one was highlight your medical credentials, even if it means you've received virtually no formal training in nutrition. Step number two was shock and awe, make incredible claims. Step number three, cite studies even when they don't back up your claims. It fools people who don't have the time to check 
into believing there is some good science behind what you're saying. Step four, keep it simple. Give quick one-word answers to solve everybody's problems. Step five, use logical fallacies, the way politicians do, to fool people. Step six, build and market your brand. Step seven, as Dr. John McDougall likes to say, give people good news about their bad habits. That's how you make them love you. Step eight, sell your products or services. Why else would you go through all this trouble if it wasn't to make money? Step nine, rely heavily on anecdotal evidence that people can easily relate to. Now, let me give you a bonus. Step number 10. It's just one word. And the word is repeat. That's right. Every few years, or even less, people lose attention, right? And so they need something new to excite them. So you write your next diet book just in time. And you repeat all the steps again. Continuing to sell books and products and seminars, making appearances on TV and whatnot, all this while you're contributing to the confusion that people feel about nutrition and health. At the start of this lecture, I made a bold statement, a promise, if you will. I said that your ability to separate proper health information from marketing disguised as science can save your life. I said that. And now I want to give you a specific example of what I meant. An example which will highlight why we had to go through all these steps to arrive to this point. This is Bob Harper. He's a famous personal trainer. He has celebrity clients. And he's most known for being a charismatic trainer on the Biggest Loser reality television show. Now everything was going well for Bob Harper up until 2017. He had written over four weight loss books. He was appearing on numerous TV shows. For example, in 2016, he appeared on The Rachel Ray Show and showed viewers how to make his high-fat morning coffee, where he adds coconut oil and butter and blends it all together. And that, he says, is his morning breakfast every single day. And around that time, he was advocating the popular so-called paleo diet, which means no beans, no grains. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? But meats, fats, and oils were good to consume. Of course, this type of diet was made famous by many doctors with best-selling books. So that's what Bob Harper was doing up until early 2017 when he suffered a heart attack. A heart attack known as the widow maker. It's called that because over 90% of men don't survive it. And the reason he survived is because there were doctors close by who were able to save his life. In the hospital, he was placed in a medically induced coma for two days and had stents placed to open up his coronary arteries. Now, after he recovered and walked out of the hospital, do you think that Bob continued with his previous diet? No. He did a complete 180. And guess what? His new diet book has just been released. And it's all about eating whole grains and beans. Now, here's a question. What changed his mind? Was there any incredible new discovery in science while he was recovering from his heart attack? No, there wasn't. He just became better at looking at the evidence because his life depended on it. And my next question is, did his fans have to go through this journey with him, buying every book, listening to every piece of advice he gave, watching him contradict himself over and over again through the years? No, they didn't. Because it doesn't matter what celebrities say about nutrition. It doesn't even matter what doctors say about nutrition. Unless the scientific evidence strongly supports their claims. And so the public's ability to learn how to separate marketing 
from real, ethical, scientific evidence becomes a life and death issue. There is nothing more important than nutrition to prevent and reverse disease. So we need to get this right. We need to understand that amazing discoveries in this field are not made overnight or even over a few years. The way we can form strong opinions about nutrition and health is when we see multiple studies, different types of studies, from independent and unrelated sources spanning decades, all beginning to converge on certain conclusions. This is when we see the flow of information becoming incredibly consistent, and we can be very confident about our conclusions. Confidence. This is what I've learned can help people more than anything else. Let me explain with my closing remarks. When individuals or couples or families come to my office, I know that if I just give them my recommendations on how to change their diet, they would leave feeling as confused and frustrated as they were before they walked into the room. Because the last thing they need is one more opinion, right? What they need is confidence in themselves. And to help with this, I realized long ago that I had to spend most of the session explaining the scientific process and not just the results of studies. Showing how we come to our conclusions. And I actually teach them to question every single claim I make. I tell them, if I say something that contradicts what you thought you knew, do not walk out of this office until you have fully understood the evidence on both sides. And I'm going to show you how to question it so that you yourself will arrive to your own conclusions. And once they learn to do this, they begin to see how the flow of evidence regarding what to eat for optimal health has been consistently moving in the same direction, converging on some very strong conclusions about the benefits of a plant-based diet. And I want people to see that for themselves because I've discovered a secret. Do you want to know what my secret is, my diet secret? Okay, I'll tell you. When you combine scientific evidence with the knowledge of how to properly interpret it, and you add confidence on top of that, you get people who are willing and able to change their habits and improve their lives because they begin to feel empowered. And that's a beautiful thing. Thank you.